course I buried all my information. There we go. Uh, first off, uh, hi everybody. My name is Chris Hill. Um, I'm with Passos Canada. I'm currently the treasurer of the board and have been um, asked to help out a little bit more uh, in what we're doing. So, so that's why you're uh, seeing my pretty face on these things now. Um, I wanted to first off, thanks everybody for virtually attending. I know that these Zoom meetings are plentiful for lots of us these days, and uh, and we really appreciate you you coming out. Um, I personally, and I know a number of other people, wanted to really get these Vancouver socials back going, even if it is virtually. Uh, a lot of familiar faces, and uh, we definitely have a strong presence of Passos Canada in on the West Coast. Um, so that was the idea with getting these socials kind of back up and going uh, in a virtual place. Uh, hopefully they won't have to be virtual for much longer. Uh, we've got a pretty good program for the year lined up. Uh, on that note, uh, the next social uh, is June 16th. So at same time, I'm going to leave this time frame at six to eight for Vancouverites. Uh, we are recording the presentations and do give them out afterwards uh, if you're not able to attend. Um, the AIBC credits are for attendees only though, as a note. Uh, I've got a June 23rd technical group, uh, three to 5 p.m. Uh, hopefully we can get a bigger audience across the nation for that one. And then the all important bike tour um that's been a really good social for this area uh, is july 4th um that is you want to advance me one slide printed mm -hmm. remember which is next uh at this point uh so we've we've kind of renamed these socials in the house online social series uh we did want to thank our sponsor sega uh, and just make a note that we do uh, collaborate with Zebex on uh, on putting these together. And uh, thank you for their support. Um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Sean St. Amour. Um, most of you, I'm sure, on this line already know who he is. Uh, he's been a big instrumental part of putting these socials together. And he is going to help moderate today. So thank you, Sean. Thanks, Chris. Good evening, everyone. Glad to uh, have everyone back. Uh, just go through the rules of the evening. So ideally, if you can uh, put your uh, uh, mic on mute while we're going, so we don't hear any, any background things um, to speak, you can do something quick. Just hit the uh, space bar and it should unmute you. Um, if there's any large chatter, Chris will just shut us all down mute wise and then, and then allow certain people to speak. Um, and I will be checking on questions. So during the presentation, add your question into the group chat. Uh, you can see there's already, again, some stuff going on with Chris putting in that link. Um, so just add your questions and I will keep uh, creating a queue. And then once we're finished, I'll help uh, dive into it. And then ideally is I don't want to ask your questions. I will request that you come on and, and ask your questions and then we'll just kind of keep passing it through the group. Um, and then for those, again, don't know me, again, Sean Sanamore. I've been involved with these socials, I think, for almost three years now. Again, I... Um, just love learning about Passive House and the fact that I convinced um, other people to come out and uh, and see it just means that I don't get to drink alone and I get to learn with more people. So really appreciate you doing that. Um, apologize for wearing a hat uh, during COVID. I only really take showers on Saturdays and Wednesdays and so you missed it today. So you're getting an ugly scruffy Sean. Uh, I'm sure some of us all need a haircut and uh, with this whole phase two rolling up, maybe we will line up and see the barber or your stylist or whoever you need to see. Um, that being said, we have an amazing lineup here and I'm going to stop goofing around and turn over to the crew here because this project is really interesting and they put a lot of work into providing some uh, great information. So Prudence, I'll send it over to you. Hey everyone, I'm Prudence Ferreira. Um, I'm the Passive House Practice Lead at Morrison Hirschfield and I'm the Passive House Consultant on this project. Um, the location is 825 Pacific. And um, it's a really great project, uh, near and dear to me, because it's for the arts. It's for an arts organization. You'll hear more about that um, from our team as we go. So we're going to be sharing some highlights and lessons to date from this project. Um, so far, it is actually the first high rise um, that's Passive House that's under construction. There are more uh, in planning right now, but with everything sort of on hold or uncertain. Um, it might be the first one for a while. 
uh, hopefully that won't be true and all of the other projects will go up um, as planned. Uh, but as such, we are um, having an opportunity to learn a lot about this building typology um, within the context of building in Vancouver. And so we wanted to share with the community um, what we've learned along the way. So um, I want to introduce our team. Uh, there's me, and then we're going to hear from Mark Sawyer. He is with Grosvenor Group, and he's been very active with the team on a day-to-day -day basis, um, representing Grosvenor as a development manager. We also have Patrick McMarrow. Um, he is also a Passive House consultant. He works with IBI Group, and he's the architect on the project. So we're lucky enough to have a, a couple of Passive House folks. Um, we have also with us today uh, Billy Sue. Uh, with Integral Group. He's our electrical designer and Solomon Fung, uh, who did all of the systems design, also from Integral Group. And then we've got Tate Fryer, who is our project manager for uh, Leadcore Group, our constructor, and Dan Geddes uh, from Flynn, who is helping, um, well, really instrumental in actually putting together the unique wall system that we've got for our exterior envelope. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mark Sawyer. Thanks, Prudence. Um, hi, everyone. As Prudence said, Mark Sawyer. I'm with Grosvenor. Um, I'm responsible for the, the development management of this building. I'm just going to give you a, a brief sort of um, overview introduction to the project, and then I'll turn it over to the, the smart people to talk about the stuff that everyone came to listen to today. So A25 Pacific, um, it's a seven story, 24,000 square feet building. It is actually a community amenity contribution for Grosvenor's uh, adjacent residential tower. We acquired the site um, a couple of years ago, just, just after acquiring the, the site for the tower in anticipation of the community amenity uh, negotiation. It was our, our preference to, to not only provide a, a cash contribution, but also to provide an in-kind contribution. And, and that's essentially what we've ended up doing. So this building at the end of construction will be transferred to the city of Vancouver, who will become the owner. The intended purpose, as Prudence mentioned, is for it to be a multi-purpose arts and culture hub. And the city of Vancouver will provide a long-term lease to an operator who was actually announced um, a couple months ago, and that'll be BC Artscape. So they'll be operating this building um, on a go-forward basis. And city of Vancouver, obviously, their lofty goals to be the greenest city in the world included in that CAC negotiation that this building would be required to be built to the past of our standards. And that's essentially how we arrived where we are today. It's been a great opportunity for, for myself and, and obviously the rest of the team to, to go through the process. And, and we've learned a lot so far, and I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot more as we, as we go through the rest of it. And, for me personally, it aligns very well with, with Grosvenor's corporate commitments. Grosvenor's committed to net zero operational carbon by 2030 and, and net zero embodied carbon by 2050. So this has really been a great way for us to sink our teeth into a project um, on a relatively small scale and, and kind of get some learnings along the way. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the rest of the team will touch on the, the technical aspects of the project. All right. Um, so my name's uh, Patrick McMorrow, and um, thanks for the introduction, Prudence. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a uh, certified passive house consultant with IBI, um, and we're the architect of record on this project. So um, it was a great introduction, Mark. I think. Um, you know, this, this has been um, a, a, a great learning experience for IBI working with Grosvenor um, since the, the, the idea that this would be a passive house at this central location um, between the bridges in 
downtown Vancouver um, and to be um, the first high-rise passive house in Vancouver is going to be uh, it's an innovative project uh, incorporating you know um, reading code is challenging high-rise um, brings up different um, different challenges um, and um, I'll discuss that as we go through the slides. So you could go to the next one there, Prudence. So taking a closer look at the site, you can see between the bridge, this is an urban area, it's walkable, it really meets a lot of uh, sustainable criteria. Um, so adjacent to Grosvenor's uh, 40 story uh, residential development, this will provide a cultural amenity uh, that ties in with um, the Vancouver House District and um, the cultural um, quarter that is emerging uh, along that uh, north side of uh, Foss Creek. Um, this image just, just gives us a good idea of, of what's happening, what's uh, pedestrian, cycle friendly, transit oriented, and this, this development really ticks a lot of the boxes and Passive House was a, was a natural fit for um, an artist building on a quite uh, compressed and tight site where we're going to build um, the most, uh, pretty much to the property line or, or build the maximum volume allowable um, to set back lines. And so you, you get an idea there on the image on the right, uh, the ongoing developments nearby, the Governor's Tower, the Vancouver House and Burrard Place. Um, can you go to the next slide? And these are some ideas of the context. So when planning out a passive house building, we're thinking about where the shading is coming and what the neighboring buildings are. So we're on the north side of um, Pacific uh, Street, um, just below the bridge, um, overpass Granville Bridge on ramps. So um, we're actually getting some shading in the lower levels from the ramp. And then there's a building on the opposite side of Pacific that's also um, incorporated in, in the shading analysis. Um, so Morrison Hirschfield, uh, of course, with the uh, Passive House uh, consultant who prepared the package for um, for uh, PHI as the certifier. Um, we will go to the next slide, Prudence. So just to give an idea, this is the this is our current Revit model. This is an export where we're at. You've probably seen some other images of the building, and um, they went through design and. Um, uh, through rezoning, a uh, development permit, and um, right now it's um, the, the, the raft slab um, in the bottom of excavation is uh, being poured, concrete raft slab. So we're, um, we're beginning to see this project that we've all been working on for a number of years emerging out of the ground. So it's, it's a really exciting opportunity to kind of present it to the community and um, now it's open up for questions, lessons learned, and, and Make this building a resource um, for the community in Vancouver. So just on this slide, you'll see along the bottom there the, the consultant team, um, ACDF, or the Montreal-based um, design architect who um, developed the design for um, Grosvenor Specific and also this uh, building. So there's a there's a language between both buildings. Um, there's um, similar materiality and um, in some sense, there's some massing the the tower that you see in the background of Prudence's uh, image or uh, or Mark's um, uh, background on Zoom. That's the tower that this is sitting adjacent to, and just in the bottom left corner here, you see the uh, yeah. Thanks, Prudence. You see the uh, the um, heritage house. So there's a lot going on in this site. So that heritage house was um, has been adjusted and now this is a building that looks back and uh, looks west. This is the entrance you're seeing uh, from a laneway which is um, adjacent to um, the Pacific Tower, the Four Story Tower and this um, uh, heritage building. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and I can talk about design development. And okay, so this one's the site plan. So this is useful. This is a site plan, like a technical drawing that shows the Pacific Tower, uh, the Leslie House, House. So the number of stories is shown there in a big circle. So 39 stories shadowing from the west. So that's providing some, um, some relief to uh, the evening winter sunshine um, and any potential overheating risk. To the north, we have the executive inn, so we're, we're quite uh, we're building to the property line. 
and um, we're minimizing the um, fenestration uh, to the west, to the north um, because of the neighbor and also for um, for optimal um, glazing in our plastic house. And then you can see on the right hand side the, the Granville Bridge um, on ramp and the elevation of that is above our finished uh, floor for level one. You can see there's a number of roof levels, but basically the form is as compact as possible. Um, this was kind of you know a, um, a learning process for Morrison Hirschfield, led uh, the design architect ACDF, um, and the city as the as the client as you know the you know uh, the, the the future owner, owner being the client and the city of Vancouver and um, being like the big driving force that made this a passive house and um, that uh, that uh, kind of curated the occupancy of this and so now we're calling it artscape i suppose um 825 pacific we often refer to it as artscape because it's an artist uh, building and and like mark mentioned they're going to be the occupants so on the next slide i wanted to talk about um okay so this is just an idea of what's happening on the ground floor so we've zoomed in now to the scale of the building itself and you can see Close to the property line, there's a bicycle lane and pedestrian sidewalk on the south end. And this building is just filling its site, you know, and there's loading on the left hand side um, where we can bring in it's like it's gallery space. So there may be art pieces um, being delivered and being um, displayed on this lower level. Um, the floor plate is quite similar um, for each floor going up with some shifting left and right as the volume of the building steps out to provide an overhang at the building entrance. Uh, and there's also an overhang on the, um, the west side where, uh, sorry, the east side, you can see the exit doors there are overhung by the building mass itself. So that's a, an efficient way of, um, of, you know, massing the building, providing overhangs, and we just wrap, fully wrap that softer condition and in insulation. Interesting to note in this plan, the vestibule is outside of the passive house envelope. And um, so we enter into the main gallery space through a, a non passive house vestibule. Um, and, and there's car sharing provided. So uh, in the negotiations, the, the basement floor um, is providing car, uh, bicycle parking only. Uh, there's no uh, on site car parking, which was a very progressive policy from the city of Vancouver to this is a sustainable building um, in downtown setting where we don't need to be um, car um, dependent. Let's go to the next slide. So this is about uh, design development and how we design passive houses and we have an idea and then you know uh, and we test it in the passive house uh, planning package energy model and you know sometimes we have to make revisions. So on the left was a an early stage design um, with uh, kind of a granularity to the elevation um, and uh, some pixelation where um, there's a lot of narrow windows um, providing an interesting um, <coughs> elevation. But um, the, the tables at the bottom will kind of, if you go to the bottom right hand number in each one, you'll see the window perimeter at 4,000 square feet versus 21. And, Passive House Consultants on, on the call will say, okay, so the one on the right is going to perform better here, we can tell, because there's less um, installed window um, junctions, there's less jam, there's less uh, sill and less window head. And we've managed to uh, translate, you know, the design intent to a product, to a building, which is um, magnificent, um, aesthetically continuing the pixelated effect and uh, using um, metal panels uh, with different reflectivities and uh, shades of uh, of the aluminum metal panel um, which is being installed. So the, the construction, um, I'll get to the construction maybe on the next slide. And you can also see just the last item on this that we, we reduce the percentage opening from 25.2 to 15.2. So that's a big gain in our um, in our energy model, and that allowed us to do some more interesting massing, um, where the overhang on the entrance or the um, or the east side, you can allow for that kind of um, additional building envelope uh, drafting because we've made such uh, such gains on the um, window installing. 
Yep, next slide. So this is a section we put together kind of um, to just give a, an overview of the building. Like it's a simple building. That's the beautiful thing about passive houses. You know, we, we design it to keep it simple and uh, build it um, efficiently, effectively, near tight. Um, so this is about how the HRV sits on the roof and you can see similar um, efficient um, artist studio spaces on each level from seven to two. And then a gallery space, which gets uh, additional height on the ground level. So, um, the HRV is supplemented with the VRF system. And I won't go into too much detail. We have mechanical engineers who work this out um, for optimal efficiency. From this section, you can tell this is a concrete, um, conventional con concrete steel stud uh, exterior wall build. Um, just one story of basement. So there's a lot of efficiency there that we're not um, excavating for um, excessive car parking. And we are um, containing in the basement um, as inside the passive house envelope. So that's one of the interesting uh, points of this building that, that we don't see um, in every passive house building. And we can discuss further the, the, the design implications and, and the decision to uh, fully enclose the basement. But that houses uh, bicycle lockers, end of trip facilities with showers and um, uh, the mechanical uh, rooms and equipment. Uh, and there is a green roof um, on uh, the, over the entrance. These are um, uh, non-intensive green roofs um, to reduce the um, uh, heat island effect. Uh, okay, and then so on the, uh, I'll quickly talk through the details and um, leaving it open to further questions or discussion later, but our perfect detail um, this is a revised parapet detail where we, we use steel stud and completely wrap it in insulation. Um, uh, learned with Ledcore, the contractor, and with um, our consultant team, different techniques. But originally, we had shown this as a concrete parapet, uh, changed to steel stud, and we kept the exact same thermal efficiency with a large uh, plywood plate on top, which is wrapped in insulation. Um, so, thermal bridge free detail. Okay, and the next one. So our soffit detail, which I mentioned, um, our wall assembly here, you can see um, at the top of that detail is a six inch steel stud filled with um, bat insulation. Then um, we're showing 10 inches of exterior rock wall and that's supported with a thermally broken cladding system and um, aluminum uh, composite panel cladding by Flynn. So um, I'm gonna let uh, let the rest of the team, like our construction team, we we can work it together. And this this is developed from what our um, what our original drawing set was. On the wall base detail, you can see our interior basement there is fully insulated uh, below the uh, slab, and um, this footing continues to a raft slab. We're uh, using XPS um, and then transitioning that to the rock wall above grade and um, mineral wall insulation. But you can see it's continuous uh, insulation for the basement, and um, which um, made our, our lives easier when detailing penetrations from all the mechanical rooms up into the, um, into the uh, gallery spaces. Okay, next one. And so critical to every class of house is our window install detail. And um, we're working with um, fiberglass windows um, being su provide, uh, supplied by Cascadia, um, Passive House certified window, so that, um, that um, meets all our requirements for our energy model. And um, we have uh, multiple operable windows on every floor as you'd expect. So um, there's an interesting discussion here as well, but you can see we've placed the um, window uh, outboard from the external insulation and we've used a um, steel support angle to, uh, to hold the window on the sill. 
and this was very deep window cell where you can sit and the interesting discussion that comes up is that we were able to optimize this for ease of construction and we were able to um, through the um, through the really amazing process uh, that Martin Hirschfield and Ledcor curated we, we met with the um, uh, uh, trades uh, who were installing these windows, providing the windows, and and um, and flat and contractor, um, and we're able to refine how this works for um, maximum efficiency on site, um, speed of construction, and uh, still maintain thermal performance, which meets uh, Bassett House criteria. Um, and the same then, so on the window head detail, by moving the window in. This, this detail also revises, this, but um, you can see in this version, we're showing full installation past the concrete uh, slab with our uh, thermally broken system um, and our cladding um, fully thermally broken. So um, that's the architectural details. Um, and um, basically, I finished my presentation by saying this this has been a, um, an incredible learning experience you know we're starting now pouring concrete in the ground so if we've learned this much at this point or maybe we're going to learn the same amount in the next uh, in the coming year as we complete construction and uh, we're really enjoying it and looking forward to it and looking forward to sharing it with the community of uh, us first and consultants uh, in Vancouver and at this point I pass it over to Billy the electrical uh, engineer Actually, there's one more thing to say about this, um, which is the evolution of the, the window details. So you guys will notice, um, well, I'm just going to draw attention to a couple of things. So I'm going to go back to the previous slide. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you'll notice, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah, okay. So right here where my cursor is, this is actually a, a steel angle that is attaching um, and holding the weight of the window, attaching it back to the, to the structure. And you'll notice that there's actually a, a plywood window box or a window buck that's running over the top of that angle and underneath the, the sill of the window. Um, so remember that, sort of tattoo that in, in your brain. And then if we look at the head detail, we can see also that we have this three quarter inch ply uh, window box that's uh, moving from the interior to the exterior, and the window is essentially being slid into that window box. So if we look at the next slides, which are from our shop drawings, um, we'll see the evolution. So I wanna first describe how this process happened because this is something that everyone can learn from. Uh, typically in design bid build projects where we're going out for public bid, uh, we don't really have the benefit of having the input of the trades uh, in the design development process. We may have some input, but not as much as would be ideal. And so one of the very important um, aspects of truly integrated design, which is so important for Passive House, not only the performance, but for minimizing costs and maximizing constructability, is to get together everyone at the very start of construction or before construction. So once the, the construction manager is hired on, and once the trades are hired on, everyone comes together in an integrated uh, workshop where we start looking at shop drawings before shop drawings are even complete, before anyone maybe has even started drawing shop drawings. And we talk about air barrier continuity um, between the trades, between the vertical and the horizontal. Uh, sometimes, uh, like on this project, the, the horizontal trades are the same. So the, the folks doing subgrade and doing the roof, that's the same trade. Then we have Flynn doing the wall, and then we have VIP doing the window installation. So um, what we did was we talked through from bottom to top all of the air barrier continuity, and we also brought in um, uh, technical representative Michael Blousefield from Cascadia to help us as we discuss the window details. And something really magical happened there where we got Flynn talking about the window installation. We got our site superintendent from LEDCOR talking about the window installation. Um, Patrick and the team from IBI were in the room. I was in the room with the PHPP model open. Grosvenor was in the room. We were all there together. 
And we just started picking apart the detail and saying, well, do we actually need that plywood? What happens if we get rid of it? Do we need it for ease of installation? Is it gonna be easier for air barrier installation? And this was something that Daniel from Flynn brought up. Um, if we actually get rid of this, this plywood that we saw on the previous slide. So this plywood that's extending, you guys can see it there. So now if we look at the evolution of the detail, you see the plywood is now stopping. You guys see that? It's not extending the way that it did before. Um, so we've actually made the air barrier detailing easier because we don't need to deal with that, that piece of plywood. So this is the head. Now at the sill, you'll notice what happens is because we don't have that plywood extending, the angle could come right up underneath the, the window itself. Uh, so we did have some concern about thermal bridging, right? I mean, the, the angle here, this is a metal angle, it's steel. It's embedded in insulation. It's right up against the sheathing. So the inside of it, there's not gonna be any condensation risk on the inside where it's sandwiched in the insulation. But where it starts to get closer to the exterior ambient temperature here where it's moving horizontally underneath the window frame, we were a little bit concerned about that. And so we did some additional thermal modeling to see what the impact would be. And um, we modeled the shim space with uh, insulation, so mineral wool stuffed between the shim space. We modeled the plastic shims, right? They, those are essentially acting like a thermal break. And we found that, that we were actually fine. We didn't have any condensation risk. The window um, positioning moved a little bit. And so we modeled it actually, even before we worked out this detail, we modeled it real time in that shop drawing session to see like, how far could we push the window? Um, how much worse could we make the installation detail and still comply? And so right there in that shop drawing workshop, we started to create this evolution, which is where it's ended up now. Um, Daniel, if you're available to speak to this from the perspective of the simplification of installing the air barrier, that would be great. Yeah, so to, to have a plywood buck uh, projecting into the insulation plane, uh, jam, head and sill, um, from an install perspective on site, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, to maintain the continuity of the air barrier. There are so many gussets and detailing to do on the inside and outside corners. Um, and with having to pass uh, uh, airtight tests, it's, it becomes a concern, um, the details on how we manage the air barrier and tie it into the perimeter frame of, of the window. So to remove um, the projections, so to speak, and flatten out and have um, outside corners and no inside corners on the membrane, is far easier for the field guys to execute the membrane in such a way that we've got confidence of it passing uh, the test. So that was the primary driver of, of removing the plywood bucks that pushed the window further out into the insulation plane. Thanks, Daniel. So I'm just going to show you guys one more time so it's clear. So right now you can see the dotted line. It's a little bit hard to see. We should have marked this up for you guys, but the dotted line is the air barrier. So it's it's going here where my cursor is along the top of this plywood buck and then it's turning this corner and it's going behind that steel support angle. So we've actually got, um, uh, it's a membrane, right? But then the steel angle is fastened on there and Daniel, were we putting any adhesive? Was it gonna be embedded in adhesive on top of that membrane also? Yeah, and the uh, compatible adhesive for, for the fasteners. Um, the, the angle is actually uh, exterior of the air barrier. So it's, it's only the fastener, fastener condition that has to be looked after. So a few dabs of compatible sealant on, on the membrane uh, before you place the angle in the screw and you've got an airtight seal. So what we had before, what was making it so complicated if we go back to the sill, is that this buck was requiring that we essentially move all the all the way around it, right? So that's a, like a lot of origami that was going to cause um, heartache <laughs> and additional labor in the field for um, 
for installing the windows and integrating that air barrier onto the exterior wall. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk for just a little bit about uh, thermal performance. Um, Daniel's gonna talk a little bit about this later, but we looked at a bunch of different clips when we were trying to figure out the best way to skin this building. We looked at Cascadia clips, we looked at Northern facades, um, horizontal versus vertical arrangement. We looked at EIA and we ended up going with the EIA clip. And Daniel's gonna talk a little bit more about that later. But you can see just in this chart, um, and this chart doesn't actually uh, reflect the spacing, the final spacing that we have, but you can see in the chart, there are different spacings, right? There's vertical spacing, inches on center, horizontal spacing, inches on center. Um, the wall height and wall width that, that comes out in the wash. And then there's bracket efficiency. So you can see of these different thermal brackets, um, the EOT is not the most thermally efficient if we're just looking at the bracket by itself. But Dan is going to talk to us a little bit later um, about why the EOT ended up being our first choice, but I'm going to give a little precursor to that, which is when we're looking at thermal clips, it's not just about the efficiency of the bracket, it's about um, whether it's a, a vertical or horizontal system and ultimately what the clip density is, right? So we ended up being able to have a better performance even with a specific clip that had worse thermal performance looking at it in isolation. Uh, we had better overall effective R value for the wall because the clips were spaced out further apart. So, um, it's a pretty important thing to think about fairly early on when you're doing these um, high rise buildings uh, where we're doing exterior mineral wall insulation, could even be low rise, anywhere where we're doing exterior mineral insulation where we need uh, clips. So um, I'm just gonna breeze through the thermal performance of our details. Um, we did uh, preemptively model multiple thermal bridges that we knew PHI was going to ask us about. Um, we ended up uh, not modeling others. We used some placeholders from the Building Energy Thermal Bridging Guide. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, it's an online resource now. You can check it out at betb.ca. It's a whole library of details modeled in 3D. Not all of them are passive house appropriate, but there's a handy dandy slider where you can only look at the most efficient or you can choose to just look at the most efficient details. Um, but these are the ones that we actually modeled specifically. So um, the detail performance for our uh, typical footing, um, we can see the, um, the psi value here in watts per meter Kelvin ended up being 0.139. Um, and we, uh, we also modeled our elevator shaft, we had something interesting happening here. So underneath this, this concrete area here is actually dirt. So it's a little interesting. Um, and our psi value there ended up being 0.462, so not fantastic. And this is just to say we can still have thermal bridges in passive house projects. Of course, we need to make sure uh, that we're not causing any condensation risk. But passive house projects, especially when we start getting into these larger um, concrete and steel structures, we're going to have them. Um, it's, a, it's a factor of mitigating as many as we can, and then the ones that we can't avoid, we have more tolerance for them in the energy model. Um, for our ground floor base of wall, uh, we ended up at a 0 0.065, so this is actually pretty good. Um, and then for our uh, parapet, we ended up with a negative thermal bridge. And Patrick talked about this before. This is thermal bridge free. So this one was the, the rock star of all of our details. Pretty easy to achieve there. Um, and then um, I have one more to share, which is our, oh, okay, sorry. My computer was lagging. <laughs> Uh, we did model the window head, and later on we actually modeled the sill as well in the way that I described with the, uh, the plastic shims and the mineral wool in the shim space. Um, 
And it was modeled initially uh, with the thermal buck. So we actually ended up with uh, performance that's a little bit better than what we show here. We didn't spend the money to go back and, and remodel that again. Um, and that's sort of a call that the individual teams need to make on every project because um, PHI will accept conservative estimates. And if you improve from where you started or where you've modeled the thermal detail, if you get better, they're not going to necessarily ask you to do another model. Um, so they're letting us use this number, even though we know that we've got something a little bit better now uh, since we've eliminated a portion of that, that plywood uh, box around the window. Um, in terms of the, the thermal bridges that end up in the PHPP for a building of this type, um, We've got all the typical ones, the door, head, jam, sill. Um, and we actually chose to do it a little bit differently. Um, for those of you who are modelers, you, you may know that um, the, the SI install of the window um, can go uh, with the window component itself. Um, or you can simply zero that out and actually put, um, put your thermal bridges associated with your window installation in the thermal bridges worksheet. Um, we chose to do it that way since we modeled those, those things uh, separately. And then um, we have all of the other ones that you just saw. We also have uh, roof mechanical pedestals, um, roof anchors. So these are things that are going to show up on uh, these larger buildings. Screen supports for the mechanical screens. Uh, the corners of the building, that's pretty typical that, that most buildings will have those. Intermediate floor, floor bypass, uh, below grade footing and elevator shaft, those are pretty commonplace to rain, water, and sanitary pipe, um, and then column backup wall. So the ones that are a little bit special for these project types are going to be things like the mechanical pedestals, the roof anchors, the screen supports. We also had a detail for parking bollard. So parking bollards might come up um, because if you remember, we have the basement and then we have uh, the lane up above with loading and those parking bollards needed to be anchored down. So we had to provide a uh, thermal break there. Um, the other thing that we ran into that doesn't show up on this list, but it's important to, to think about is if you have um, any kind of pumps that are inside your thermal envelope, the doors or the, the hatches for those pumps, um, you can get them with gaskets, which will help with air tightness, but you can't get those doors insulated. So we've had to come up with some pretty interesting creative workarounds for being able to insulate our sump pump door. Um, and that's something that's good to know ahead of time if you're gonna go the route of including the basement and the envelope. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Billy Sue now to talk about our lighting design and uh, then we'll we'll keep trucking through and just so you guys are aware we're we're sort of going through in uh, an order of lessons learned on the project chronologically. All right thanks Prudence. Um, yeah after that exciting envelope evolution I'm gonna now talk about some boring lighting stuff we figured out. Um, again, my name is Billy Su, and I'm from Integral Group. I'm working on this uh, project with Calvin Chang and Ivan Lee, also from uh, Integral Group. Um, we've been, uh, as uh, Integral Electrical, we have been working on multiple uh, residential projects, um, but uh, this project has been the unique and special one for us as, uh, as the first commercial passive house project. Um, as usual, we started this project by targeting the LPD as 30% better than ASHRAE. And uh, the design was achieved by using high vacuum uh, LED lighting fixtures and uh, automatic lighting control system. Um, later in the design stage, we were requested by a uh, passive house institution to reduce the LPD from 0 0.9 watts per square foot to uh, 0 0.25 watts square foot, um, which gave us a lot of headache between me and Prudence. And uh, we finally pushed that down to, I think, 0 0.27. And uh, we realized that was the bare minimal life safety requirements for uh, Canadian electrical code. Um, after several design coordination meetings, um, we 
really want to make sure that the design tense was still there um, to make this building a true passive house uh, commercial building. Um, so by providing a, such a minimal life safety uh, level, we we'll defeat the purpose. So we we work closely with City of Vancouver with what the intention of each space of the building will be. And we came up with the lighting design you see on the left of that slide. Top is the rendering for how the level one uh, gallery space is um, supposed to be if there's an event. And we also have a lighting control system that can be controlled by the owner of the building um, to uh, meet the general um, usage of that space. Um, so the final design that we're providing, including Mersum level of lighting in ground floor and uh, like general lighting for the shell space, anything above. And also as the base building design team, we're providing a menu to city of Vancouver, such how they can maintain the passive house usage of this building after they took over. Um, but unfortunately, the new lighting load will not meet the energy consumption um, for, for the passive house requirement. And this will lead on to uh, uh, modification on the, on the mechanical side. And uh, our mechanical team and, uh, and it made it happen. So now I'm going to transfer this to Solomon from Integral Mechanical to talk about what they did. So I'm just going to insert um, uh, a interval here to introduce what Solomon is going to tell us about. Essentially, we backed ourselves into a corner. PHI said, well, we recommend this lighting power density. And we said, OK, and that's what led us to the minimum life safety. But we have a tenant. City of Vancouver has a tenant in here that wants to use a space for art, right? So it's either art gallery or art production, and you need light for that. You got to have light. We have lots of windows. I mean, we reduce the, the, the glazing area, yes, but we still have lots of daylight. But what ended up happening was the tenant said, this is not going to work. There's no way. So because we had to um, increase the lighting power density just so they could operate the building to its intended use, we ended up exceeding the primary energy. Um, we did not uh, use the PER path for this project. It was started uh, before PER was uh, sort of the, the mainstream way to go. So we're complying with PE. Um, and we don't have any renewables on the building either. Um, but essentially what happened was that lighting power density increase drove up our internal gains and it also pushed us beyond the primary energy limit. Um, we also are cognizant of the fact that we have unknown internal gains that are going to be in the building after the tenants move in. Uh, so we had a lot of round and round with PHI about how do you want us to model this? We don't know exactly what the tenants are going to have. We can account for all of the base stuff we expect that they're going to have, but we really don't know. What we ended up doing is we modeled it as essentially an office space. Um, so. People doing art production can certainly have lots of computers to do uh, graphic renderings. Um, they also can have other equipment which is going to uh, have waste heat. So that was sort of the happy medium where we ended up agreeing with PHI. However, um, we know that there, there could be more internal gains. Um, we looked at what we could do to meet the primary energy requirement and of course the next largest load even in a commercial building was the hot water uh, so that was where we optimized and we had to go back and ask integral group um, to take a look at what it would take to actually do um, heat pump water heater so we're going to hear from Solomon about that and we're going to see some schematics, but I want to briefly mention also that one of the other things that happened when we increased our lighting power density um, and thought about the fact that we could have higher internal gains than we are necessarily modeling in the PHPP, uh, we had originally started um, prior to me coming on the project with a solar heat gain coefficient on our glazing of 0.55, which is very high. Maybe for residential, that's okay. But when you start getting into these larger internal gain dominated buildings, that 0.55 is actually too high and that will push us into overheating risk. So one of the things that we considered as we were going through this process was 
can we reduce that solar heat gain coefficient significantly and how low can we go and still meet our annual heat demand? Um, fortunately, because we had uh, higher internal gains because of the lighting, that meant it was easier to meet the annual heat demand, which allowed us to take some of the solar gains out of the equation and thus reduce the, the uh, chance of overheating in the summer. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it over to Solomon now and he can tell you about our systems. Thank you, Prudence. Uh, I'm gonna apologize uh, in advance because it's uh, seven o'clock here and I do have a few dogs barking outside as people are celebrating the, um, the workers that are considered um, a necessity for our city. You know what? Let let's just take a <laughs> let's take a moment and do that. And I I want to bring attention to the fact that, yeah, every evening at seven we're celebrating um, the first responders, the nurses, the doctors, everyone who's manning the grocery stores, picking up garbage. But in our industry, our frontliners are the guys that are going to the construction site every day and putting themselves at risk. And so I want to specifically thank LEDCOR um, for being there for us and essentially putting themselves at risk every day to build our future. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So um, I'm just gonna quickly touch on uh, what we had originally, which was a fairly simplistic domestic hot water system. Um, and then I'm gonna move on to what we ended up with and then uh, finally touch on ventilation and the heating and cooling strategy that we employed. So the original domestic hot water system that we had was just localized electric water heaters on each floor that were um, located close to the terminal um, plumbing fixtures to minimize domestic hot water piping lengths. So what this uh, solution allowed us to do was eliminate the domestic hot water riser it also allowed us to get rid of the domestic hot water recirc piping system and the recirc pump. But unfortunately, of course, because of the primary energy requirement that Prudence was alluding to earlier, we had to uh, go with the domestic hot water heat pump solution. And there are a few manufacturers in our market that uh, supply equipment like this. Uh, some of the more prominent ones that I'm aware of are Sandin and Colmac. The manufacturer that we ended up going with was actually Colmac, as seen on the screen, and the model we selected was a CXV low ambient air source model, which was capable of producing domestic hot water at 140 degree Fahrenheit, while um, even, even though the ambient air conditions were as low as 10 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 12 degrees Celsius. So a benefit of swapping over to the Colmec was that there was definitely less equipment now in the building and it would provided a more centralized system for the future city of Vancouver building maintenance team or, or artscape, whoever the tenant is to, to maintain the building uh, with more ease. So next slide, please, Prudence. So uh, I'm just going to quickly touch on a simplified version of the domestic hot water schematic here. And there's going to be four points that I want to highlight. Um, the first is the location of the equipment. I had two Colmac heat pumps on the roof, while the rest of the equipment you see on the screen, such as the storage tank, the electric water heater, the mixing valve, and the domestic hot water research pump were located in a small mechanical closet on the floor directly below. The second point I want to talk about was redundancy, which was an item that we had to consider now that we had introduced a centralized system. What I did was I put in two um, Colmec heat pumps, each size for 50% of the load, so that if one ever went down for maintenance or whatever, we would still have 50% of the capacity to serve the building. Um, in addition to this, I also had an electric water heater that was to supplement um, the Colmec heat pump in the case where one went down and the, the remaining heat pump was not keeping up with the demand. The third point that I want to talk about, as some of you may have noticed, is that I actually piped the domestic hot water through the tanks in series, and uh, there's a few reasons for this. One was to increase the overall storage volume in the domestic hot water system. I actually treated the electric water heater as a secondary domestic hot water storage tank. Uh, secondly, was uh, when the domestic hot water 
uh, heat pumps, the Colmec units, and the domestic hot water research pump were not in operation, um, I would expect that the, the water inside the tanks would naturally stratify. And what this means is that the hottest water would um, migrate the outlet of the secondary storage tank or electric water heater, and the coolest water would be located at the inlet of the first storage tank. So why is this good, you may ask? Um, so basically why it's good is it increases the efficiency of the Colmac heat pumps, which want to see a lower entering water temperature. Secondly, it uh, reduces the cycling of the heat pump by ensuring that the Colmacs have uh, a long enough runtime before turning off. And uh, last of all, is um, it avoids, it mitigates the risk of the heat pumps tripping on high water, on high water temperature. So the fourth point that I wanted to talk about and the last point on the schematic is the controls. So ensuring, in order for us to ensure that the system functions the way that we want it to, because there's so many moving parts, we have to be careful with how we selected our set points. We actually had a, um, a, a temperature immersion sensor located in the first storage tank that is controlling the two pumps that are integral um, in the Colmec units or internal in the Colmec units. So whenever the temperature sensor detects the water temperature to drop to say 130 degrees Fahrenheit, the Colmec heat pumps would energize and kick on, start cycling water through the system, and they'd stop when the temperature reaches 140 degrees Fahrenheit, where we ensure that all Legionella is killed in the system. Um, secondly was the uh, temperature in the second storage tank or the electric water heater. We set the electric resistance element to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is lower than the, the other storage tank. And there's a reason for this. One, because we didn't want to use the electric resistance element as the primary source of domestic hot water heating. Um, and really its sole purpose and the reason why we put it in, besides the redundancy, was to top up the domestic hot water research um, when, when we when experiences pipe um, piping losses in the system. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to the HVAC side of things, I'm going to touch on ventilation first and then finish off with the heating and cooling system. With the ventilation system, we had a centralized passive house ERV located on the roof. And there's going to be four items I wanted to highlight. First is that the ERV was a swag on um, gold RX35. Um, and it's ducted down the building to VAV boxes that we have on each floor that are controlled off of CO2 or carbon dioxide sensors. What this allows us to do is to modulate the supply and exhaust volumes on each floor to suit the occupant demand. The second point is that another um, control strategy we implemented was a night setback or a pre-flush or pre-cool of the space um, overnight during the summer and shoulder seasons. And um, how we achieved this was by ramping down the ERV to its minimum speed setting and just letting it run continuously through the night so that it would pre-cool the space. The third point is that the garbage room is located in the basement of this building, which is within the treated floor area. And uh, we had to actually unbalance our ERV in order to, um, to put in a dedicated exhaust fan for that garbage room because we wanted to run independently and continuously um, relative to all the other systems. This way we ensured that we mitigate, mitigated the risk of odor transmission to other spaces. And the fourth point on this slide was um, that we didn't actually put in a heating or cooling coil on the discharge of the ERV, which is what uh, I've typically done on a lot of my residential passive house projects. And the reason being is that we actually had a dedicated heating and cooling system in the building. So finishing up on the uh, heating and cooling system, we determined pretty early on that the team and the city of Vancouver wanted a full cooling system because not only was the building located on a fairly busy street, um, which means that we expected the limited amounts of operable windows on each floor to be used um, fairly infrequently relative, uh, relative to what we would see in a residential building, but also, we expected a variable occupant load um, to suit the usage or the programming. So the system we ended up going with was a air-cooled VRF system. 
uh, which is an electric based refrigerant system with high, highly efficient uh, heat pump technology. So what you can see on the screen there is we had an air cool condenser on the roof, which exchanges heat with the ambient air conditions. The refrigerant then carries that down to a BC controller or BC box that we have on each floor, which then distributes the refrigerant to the terminal VRF band coil units that provide the heat space heating and cooling. The, another thing that I want to point out was the design team, the developer Grosvenor and the city of Vancouver all wanted um, to minimize the building's operational carbon. And we believe that this electric based solution was the perfect, uh, the perfect answer to that. Some other benefits of the VRF system include simultaneous heating and cooling, as well as heat recovery. And how the heat recovery is achieved is by moving heat from spaces or zones that are in cooling mode through the BC controller to spaces that require heating. Next slide, please, Prudence. So before I pass this back to Prudence, um, I just wanna to quickly touch on um, the building penetrations. Um, in particular, the plumbing vents, which um, is often a subject of debate. We actually ended up just providing the traditional passive venting system in compliance with our local building codes. And because of that, we had to end up insulating all our vent, sanitary, and uh, rainwater leader stacks in the building with two inches of insulation. We figured that with the relatively small floor plate, we were able to get away with just one roof penetration for our plumbing vents to minimize thermal bridging. And uh, back to you, Prudence. Sure. So we, um, we made the determination to put the basement actually into the envelope, despite the fact that it added additional penetrations that we needed to deal with uh, for a few reasons. And one of the reasons was um, that if we had insulation along the ceiling of the basement versus insulating everything subgrade, it didn't necessarily provide a, a better situation. And Patrick can join in and, and talking about this with me, but Patrick, essentially, we would have had to carry some insulation down the subgrade wall anyways, right? Yeah, that's right, Prudence. And um, yeah, the, the decision was that it was gonna be a better um, thermal detail if we insulated the entire basement wall rather than having that, that bridge where the structure holding the whole um, whole building up was was going to be um, penetrating through say a uh, insulated underside of level one. Right so pretty early on that that decision was made to go that direction and um, one of the things that we accomplished during our integrated shop drawing uh, workshop was to start listing out um, we asked integral group uh, to help us understand for each and every single level of the building what the penetrations were going to be and then as a team with our trades there uh, we made sure that everyone was aware of all of the penetrations and we've got some color coding on this list the electrical is blue um, the the wet connections or the the water-based connections are red everything else is black and so this list goes on we have a list for every single level of the building and the roof and it helps all of us be aware and work in a collaborative fashion towards making sure that all of these penetrations are dealt with and moreover provides somewhat of a template for standardization of different types of penetrations and ultimately what we ended up putting in our mock-up um, and as I mentioned before, LEDCORE Group has been um, really fantastic in working through this collaborative process with us, and they've really taken the ball and run with it. Um, and so we're going to hear next from Tate, who's the project manager for LEDCORE Group, about their experience uh, with the Passive House process. Okay. So uh, first thing I want to talk about, um, if you wanted to go to the next slide, the BCIT tradesperson course, uh, one more slide. So BCIT offers a passive house tradesperson course and LEDCOR negotiated with BCIT directly to offer this program to LEDCOR uh, as well as the architect. So we did that and I think there was about 15 to 20 people that attended this course. 
Um, what was great about this is it kind of allowed everybody to embrace uh, the Passive House project from the beginning and it created almost a team atmosphere from the beginning as well. Um, the course prepared everybody to write the Passive House certification exam. And also during the um, Passive House course at BCIT, we were able to uh, conduct an air tightness test, um, which was also pretty cool. Um, most of us at LEDCore, if not all of us, well, LEDCore's never done a Passive House project, but I think this is our first Passive uh, House individually for everybody at LEDCore. So it was great to be able to um, collaborate and get to know everybody um, from the very beginning um, at this course. So go on to the next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, shop drawings and submittals um, for this project. So the shop drawing and submittal process is a bit unique, uh, specifically for Passive House compared to other projects that I've been on in the past. Um, as Prudence has kind of spoke about, uh, the collaborative effort uh, from the beginning has been huge with everybody. Um, as mentioned, we had a original um, meeting where we discussed envelope and where we discussed details, uh, where we were able to come up with um, some solutions regarding the windowsill detail as, as Prudence and, and Rob, or sorry, Dan spoke about from Flynn. Um, but in terms of the shop drawings, well, another thing that we did is um, before uh, Flynn and VIP send in their formal shop drawings for review, what they did is they did a draft set and they'd send these into the consultants and to LEDCore and then we would have a meeting between the consultant team at the trade and lead core and run through the full set of draft shop drawings. And what this allowed everyone to do was kind of bring up any, anything that needed to be revised or bring up any issues or anything like that. Um, we all know that when, once we send in a formal set of shop drawings, the amount of time it takes to get reviewed. And if it's a, a re and re, it needs to go back to the, the trade get revised and sent back to the consultant, that takes quite a bit of time. Um, so what this allowed everybody to do was get a draft version, be able to kind of have input, and now it's back with the trades, and when they submit their formal version, there's probably not gonna be a lot of back and forth, and it's probably not gonna take the consultants too long to review. So that's something that we, we um, have done for this project that I haven't done with any other projects, um, getting everybody on board very early in the process, which has been key so far. So, uh, next slide. So, the quality side of Passive House. So, it's not typical for LEDCore to sit down with any of the consultants and go through uh, our project quality plan, but in this case, we did. Uh, as I mentioned, it's LEDCore's first Passive House. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to use the knowledge and experience of the consulting team, in this case, Prudence. So myself, Prudence, and LEDCore's quality manager sat down and we ran through LEDCore's um, quality plan. And what we were able to do is add a section in there for Passive House specifically. Um, this is a live document. It's ongoing. We're able to revise it whenever we want, add things to it, um, delete items to it and it's obviously going to be something that we use moving forward for any kind of lead core uh, project. So like I said, this isn't something that we typically do, um, but since it's lead course first passive house, we want to be able to um, take the knowledge and experience from all the consultant team and everybody else. And that's what we did with MH. Um, we're not at the point right now uh, in the project where um, we're taking pictures uh, on site for quality assurance or anything like that. We're kind of at the point now where I'm basically just bugging all the trades for their quality plans. Uh, so I've got uh, quite a few back and what happens once we get the, the quality plans back, our quality department will review them, make sure they're site specific and also make sure that um, there's a passive house element incorporated into them as well. Um, so we're gonna make sure that uh, we are proactive when we get to the point in um, actually having to take photo documentation uh, and provide anything that needs to go out at the end of the project uh, to MH, to Prudence. Fantastic. So this next slide is, this is where we're currently at with uh, the mock-up. Um, next door um, at the, the Pacific is also a Grosvenor project that LEDCore is working on. Uh, so we're able to do a mock-up in their parkade. So this is what we're looking at right now. Um, it's a typical exterior wall assembly, including the window head, jam and sill. 
Um, it will also include a penetration on the roof, which isn't done yet, and transitions between roofing and air barrier and transition elements for insulation and waterproofing. So once we're done this, which will probably be in about a, a couple of weeks, um, the plan will be to get the consultant team down to site as well as Flynn and VIP, have everybody come together in a social distancing manner and review and inspect this and kind of go over, um, it, it'll be a free form, you know, and anybody can bring up whatever they want uh, and we can kind of pick each other's brains about what we need to do. Um, and also from a, a testing side of things, it's, I don't think we're gonna be able to do an air tightness test on this, but I think we wanna try to do some kind of test, whether it's a smoke bomb or something. So that's something we're gonna, we're gonna bring up at the time of um, mock-up review as well. Um, and another thing regarding the mock-up is this is going to allow the trades to, I guess, like the sequence inside of things and who, who's lapping who and who's doing what and when, and it, we're going to be able to solve this now. So it's not going up the tower, whether it's Flynn doing something or whether it's VIP doing something and who's doing something when it's all something we want to iron out. Now we want to have this completely dealt with. So when we're moving up the tower, it's, um, easier hopefully <laughs> i don't know if it will be but that that's obviously the plan so and then the last slide here is just the collaboration with e3 eco group so we've been working closely with e3 eco group since the beginning of the project uh they actually attended the passive house kickoff meeting which we also held at bcit uh so e3 is a sustainable building consulting firm and they're going to be uh, performing the air tightness testing uh, on this project so we're going to be doing, I believe, three tests on this project, um, level two or level three, the roof, and then obviously the overall. Now, the first test, I think, is set to take place around October. So I'm going to make sure that I'm in touch with E3 through, throughout now until October, making sure that, you know, I know and LEDCOR knows exactly uh, what needs to be prepped pre-test. Uh, I'm going to have them down there to kind of look around and make sure that everything that they require on their end, we, we are done uh, well in advance. Uh, and then lastly, regarding the mock-up, E3 has offered to uh, come down and take a look at the mock-up as well and provide feedback. Um, they said they're more than happy to do that, um, which will be quite beneficial to, to join the team and kind of have a collaborative approach um, and get everybody's feedback as well. So that is, uh, that's it on my end. Thank you, Tate. Yeah, you're welcome. So next up, we have Daniel Geddes from Flynn to talk about uh, what's happening with our exterior envelope, and it brings us up to date. We've had some recent wins and uh, been able to achieve uh, cost savings where we didn't necessarily expect it. So he's going to tell us how we were able to accomplish that. Yeah, so... Um... In most instances, when, when we design buildings, we generally pick a thermal clip that we expect to be the most thermally efficient clip on the market based on the clip itself. Um, in actual fact, over the last 10 years of building thermally broken facades in, in the local market, we've always found that um, you're better off to reduce clip density instead. Uh, so on this project, we decided to take a look at the EOC clip. Uh, when you cloud a building and you have eight to 10 inches of rock soil between the structure and, and the cladding that's hanging off the building, you create this dead load that has to be transferred back to the structure. And generally the most thermally efficient clips are also the weakest clips on the market. And you generally find that you have to put twice as many clips onto the building to structurally attach the cladding to the building. Um, EOC clip in this instance is, is the best clip of choice that I've found. And it's, it's primarily driven by the diagonal brace that picks up the dead load of the cladding assembly um, back to the stud, which you can see that comes from the clip up the structure. So this basically stops the cladding uh, from sliding down the building and transfers all that load. And by doing that, it means we can delete 50% of the clips as opposed to the, the maybe the original specified clip. You want to move to the next slide, Prince? 
And then the other thing that us contractors look for is, is adjustability in the clip. The, the structure and the steel studs uh, tolerances uh, that those trades work to are not the same tolerances um, that creates the curb appeal or the flat, perfect facade that, that the architects and owners are after. So if we um, don't have the ability to slide the bar in and out to, to get a nice flat plane, um, that means we have to shim. Um, and shimming is only good for structural reasons up to a quarter of an inch. So to have the ability to adjust the final bar that the cladding assembly attaches to um, is, is something that should be seriously considered. The other considerations that really need to be made, um, aspect ratios, types of panels, uh, shape, size, weights, whether it's terracotta, aluminum composite, all plays into the layout of the substructure that goes in behind. And, in the past, I've found that everybody puts a clip and then tries to throw a facade over top of it. Whereas you really need to pick your facade and how it's been attached um, based on the manufacturer's requirements and then design your support structure to support that facade back to the building. So whilst on this project, uh, this was the solution that came up uh, for aluminum composite with tall, narrow panels. Uh, the layout would definitely change if you change to, say, a terracotta or a standing seam or another type of facade. So you have to be really careful that you design your facade first and then work the structure back to the studs. Um, and further to that, uh, if you're doing passive house, uh, 18 gauge studs are, are basically a bare minimum because that uh, allows us to further spread the clips out. So, and on top, go ahead. Um, a couple of the other changes that we looked at. Um, originally, the air barrier strategy or uh, was was at the inside of the drywall, I believe, the vapor barrier, um, which means that you have to uh, detail around uh, electrical boxes and and makes it difficult for a service cavity on the exterior wall. Uh, we ended up pushing the vapor barrier and slash air barrier to the exterior sheathing, um, which uh, meant some reasonable cost savings, I believe. Uh, but the other thing is it, um, it means that you've got a service cavity on, in the stud space. So uh, any services that you need to run uh, do not impact the air vapor barrier. And it also means that post occupancy, uh, that membrane is not accessible to, to the occupant. So when people hang, uh, picture frames on the wall and things like that. It's it's six inches away from the post occupants. And other than that, I guess I mean we managed to get down to eight inches as opposed to the ten inches that was originally specified because the the clip performed a lot better than originally designed. Yeah, we were, if I'm recalling directly, and you guys will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our final clip spacing was. 16 inches in one direction and 32 inches in the other direction. I can't recall which was vertical and which was horizontal. Um, no, I believe that we're doing alternate clips now on, on every, every stud. So we're 32 inches apart horizontally. Um, we still collect every stud for wind load purposes, um, but we just swap studs as we work up the, up the building. It really, right. really means that you've really got to dig into the structural engineering of the building first before you start doing your thermal analysis. Um, the industry tends to do the thermal first and structural second. Um, structural has to go first. Yeah, and that's important to note because that was something where we could have been more efficient. We did thermal modeling on our effective R value of the envelope with the given clip spacing before we really looked at the, the structural engineering and the dead load and moment on the, the actual cladding. And so um, we had to go back and do a little bit uh, more work after the fact to, to figure out if we were able to um, reduce our, our insulation down to eight inches with the adjusted clip spacing. And we were, and that's a, that's a great win for us. Um, so ultimately, where we ended up, um, we optimized the project right up to the limit, 
So we ended up with an annual heating demand of 15 kWh per meter square per year and right at the, the primary energy limit of 120. Um, and the areas where we optimized were, um, we ended up with a window installation detail that was um, better than we had had. Uh, we ended up uh, reducing our solar heat gain coefficient. Uh, we had increased internal gains that allowed us to do that and still meet our annual heating demand. Um, we were able to uh, make the additional lighting power density work by changing our hot water heater to something with a higher coefficient of performance so we could get back down under the primary energy limit. And uh, we paid attention to all of our all of our details and thermally broke all of our uh, fasteners for our mechanical uh, screens on the roof, for our roof anchors, for our bollards. Um, so all of those things, even though they're small, they end up adding to our annual heat demand, uh, which ultimately ends up adding to the primary energy. So in terms of our overall energy balance for heating and cooling, and I apologize, I've had annual method for heating and monthly method for cooling, but um, it gives you an idea of the distribution. So um, on the loss side, the primary um, culprit of losses is our windows still. You can imagine if we had double the amount of windows that we have now that it would be that much higher. Uh, we would have had to uh, try to find even better windows, which is challenging. Um, the next culprit in terms of our losses in the heating season um, is the external wall. Um, and then after that, we've got our ventilation. Um, and then in the cooling season, um, on the heat load side in terms of what is increasing the cooling, um, our solar heat load is actually now only at 23.3 um, and our internal loads are 18.9. So what this looked like before we changed our solar heat gain coefficient, which was originally 0.55 if you remember, this solar heat load was incredible. So I'm gonna go back one slide and point something out to you. You see here, our cooling demand and our cooling load is now zero. Before we changed the solar heat gain coefficient down to, um, to under 0.3, we did have numbers here. Um, we do have operable windows in the project, but um, we've got limiters on them and we don't necessarily want to rely on occupant behavior. Um, we have night flushing, which is helpful, but this, this is even better because we know sometimes in BC we have wildfires. Uh, those windows are going to remain closed. And so uh, the more we can uh, limit or eliminate any incidents or um, opportunity for overheating, the better. So um, that's, that's essentially what we've learned so far. There are many more detailed lessons we can talk about. I've got some documents up uh, to help answer people's questions. These are our email addresses. If any of you wanna get a hold of any of us with specific questions that we don't answer. And uh, with that, we can we can open up the floor to questions. Bravo, everybody! That just fantastic. Um, before we dive into questions, I do apologize. I was super excited about the presentation and forgot something very important for the group. So, if you still have any liquid in your glass or container, please <laughs> raise it up and cheers, everybody! Cheers. Nice to see local names. I know some of you don't have your uh, cameras on, but uh, again, nice to have the, the local community here. Uh, and great job, everybody. Uh, there's not too many questions in the, um, um, in the chat. I have 11, and so I still have 26 minutes scheduled. So I'm going to keep ticking off these questions until you guys tell me to stop or someone else raises their hands and, and, um, and carries on. So we will leave the, uh, the thank you up for a few minutes. Oh. Oh, all right. Someone just emailed me pre, uh, privately. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Pierce Elliott, you can come on and go ahead and start your questions. I didn't read through all them. We got a bunch of them here, um, but I'm going to let you ask ask them all. You got a few, so come online and go ahead. PC, there. Uh, yeah. Go so, ahead. The question is: How will the team ensure the interface between different trades per CSI for the construction dog? For the contract dock, 
uh, what is the verification process, how is it managed, were all openings checked and tested after fully constructed a site to see if the, pro um, the projected energy model is realized or being exceeded in performance. Uh, this is actually my first time joining Pass House event, learning. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, so if those questions are obvious to all, I apologize. <laughs> No, no, they're, they're great questions. And, and again, Prudence will coordinate with their team. But again, thank you for joining us. Again, we love having new people. Um, and uh, again, I'll let the team figure out which one for questions you want to answer. Peace. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And it's great that you're not shy about asking. Welcome to the community. It's, it's quite a great community. So let's start again with your first question. Can you repeat it? So basically, knowing on construction side, you have so many different traits, especially the window details that you guys showing earlier. Um, I can easily name three traits, the mm -hmm. facade plottings, installations, the angles, so on and so forth. How do you guys make sure that when you have different traits come in place, those uh, construction documents are actually fully realized? especially when you come to a 3D turning corners. <laughs> right, so there, there's a few, a few ways that we've addressed that. The first way we addressed it was by having an integrated shop drawing workshop. So before any shop drawings were, were finalized or even drafted, we had all of the trades come together in one room with the architect, the mechanical engineer, myself, the developer. And from bottom to top, we worked through the entire building, all of the intersections, all of the penetrations, and talked about what materials we wanted to use, what strategies we wanted to use, if there were compatibility issues between materials that we wanted to research, and who was going to be responsible for what. So that was the first step. After that, uh, the trades went away and they did their first draft of shop drawings and then they uh, submitted their drafts to the consultants. We all came together in an integrated meeting to review real time with them their drafts and to make comments so that um, the trades could collect the comments, make revisions to their shop drawings and then resubmit with our comments already included. Um, and then from there, what happened was as we went through that shop drawing review process, since it was collaborative and it was not an email chain, we were able to figure out pretty quickly when there were areas where no one was responsible. <laughs> like one thing that came up was uh, a door threshold, right? An interior yes. door threshold. It's like, okay, well, who's taking care of that? So right. that's, I, that's I, I, shop drawing is one level. I think more importantly is a site. How do you... Right. As a team, because that's the most difficult part, really. The drawings, the specs, we can go for the nice yard of details. However, at the end of the day, it's the actual constructions, the build form. How do you make sure it's complying? So, so I, I like to help with, with answering uh, these questions. Um, and this is Please. maybe a little bit from uh, Flynn's perspective. Um, I grew up in the trades, uh, my hands are scarred, and I'm now in pre-construction. Um, when I built in the fields, uh, the construction documents uh, are, are most important. So we've really done our best to slow down the shop drawing process, maybe it's a little bit to taste um, the smay, because uh, it's a, a longer lead time. Um, but to have documents that we can build off almost as bolt built quality, goes a long way for the guys in the field. It's, it's their roadmap to make sure that what has been designed has been built. And then further to that, uh, the details in question, and I've worked extensively with Patrick and Katie at Morrison Hirschfield, uh, firmly modeling a, a ton of projects. Um, they've rear wheeled, uh, verified their NX software from Simmons to make sure that the outputs in the model uh, with the 99% of, of what the actual real world is. So, so barring anything that happens on that job site where dimensions change, uh, we've got really good confidence that uh, what's on the drawings to what's executed on the sites is, is going to be uh, what is expected. And then with, with the help of Tom and, and the guys at LEDCore that look after the QA, QC process and the photo documentation, um, us and, and management can can track the projects 
Um, Flynn has daily production reports, so we, we can review those reports on a daily basis, including myself. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all all very heavily monitored. Um, okay. So, so I'm, I'm hoping, other... hoping so that are you answers saying that it's question. monitored by trades and by the main contractor at the same time? Yeah. And and please remember, there's you know on the on the facade, there's actually only two people in charge of that envelope. Flynn is primarily in charge of, of the facade and, and the membranes, and and mm -hmm. CIP is the, the window installation. There's only mm -hmm. two of us that are responsible for that. Um, and then there's been heavy discussions with Villa on on transition onto the below grade, and yep. making sure that we get our tie-ins at at parapet um, into the roofing trade. So it's it's all been very extensively looked at um, and and well planned, and I'm I'm sure with the QAQC process, if, if something goes awry from what's actually been detailed dimensionally, um, and we have further jogs in our thermal plane, or we have uh, an air barrier issue that we didn't foresee, um, that would come up in the photo documentation, and then the team would pull back in and and address the issue. Um, it's you know. It will be interesting to have a follow-up session so when you guys come to actual built um, pipeline um, to see how the planning of the quality plan and monitoring and supervision is being executed and what works, what doesn't. Absolutely. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons that we, we met ahead of time with LEDCOR to look at their quality assurance plan from a passive house standpoint, because I've been doing passive house for 10 years and I've seen all the ways it can go wrong. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> yeah. And so that, that was the first step in the process. And then Tate is going to chime in and talk about what else is happening on site. Yeah. I was just going to say that um, what, we'll, what we'll also probably do here is before uh, Flynn VIP, and Villa actually get on site. We'll have a pre mo meeting and we'll include all three of the trades. So obviously once the, the, the formal shop drawings have been submitted and reviewed, I'll, I'll pass along each trades uh, shops to the other trades. Um, but before they're actually on site and starting the pre mo meeting, we'll include all of them. I know I've spoke to uh, our site superintendent, Mike, about this and sit everybody down from a site level and just kind of go over the shops as well go over transitions all that kind of thing go over who has what um so we aren't missing anything there's no scope gaps there's no i thought we were doing this i thought we were also doing this right so that's something that we'll we'll do one more time before uh we're actually um proceeding with with these trade scopes on site and then lastly piece um there is a passive house verification process that um as the passive house consultant morrison hirschfield has um uh, a site verification um, technician that will go on site and take photographic documentation in addition to what's being taken by the construction manager. Um, and our site verification reports will uh, be submitted to the Passive House Institute. So there's multiple layers. There's quality assurance plans from the trades that get reviewed by LEDCOR. There's quality assurance plan by LEDCOR that got reviewed by me as the passive house consultant. And then there's photographic documentation from um, the trades themselves as part of their QA plans from LEDCOR as the construction manager and then from the passive house consultant as you know the, the person verifying the passive house measures are being met. So that's, uh, that's the bulk of it. Great answers, everybody. And I just want to congratulate you all. Like, I feel like this building is already built. You know, the <laughs> level of details that you guys have worked through all, well, like, it's just bravo. I mean, when you look at the success of the Clayton Community Center and um, ATMA and Ellis Dawn, um, you know, they work toward a very similar plan. But I think you guys, as a collective, have really stepped it up and pre-planned um, every little detail. And again, I... Um, I just put a note there that uh, please plan uh, an October passive house social and hopefully we can figure it to less 50 people um, to see how that those some of those uh, mid blower tests um, prevail because uh, I think you guys are going to see some really good results. Um, and I, I still have, again, we still have 16 minutes left and I still have my 12 questions. So does anyone else want to jump in before I start firing away? Again, if you want to ask a question, just uh, unmute yourself and jump in. All right, well, maybe while someone's trying to unmute. Um, 
just from the model standpoint, because you're, you know, pretty tight on the model prudence, have you looked at what a lower air tightness score, like a 0.3 would do on the model? Um, yeah, we have looked at that. And actually um, what's happening right now is the model is front loaded with a little bit more air leakage uh, than, than we might expect um, because there are things like elevator pressure relief, right? Where, you know, you just, you just can't really get around that very well. Um, and so I'm confident that we're actually going to end up in a better place than is in the model um, because what's in the model is actually more than 0.6 ACH50 right now, just to make sure that um, the ventilation losses that come from any leakage are, are already accounted for. So um, because Vancouver is a relatively mild climate, it doesn't make as much difference as it would if this project were in Ontario or somewhere colder, but uh, it definitely will help us. Gotcha. Um, sorry, let me go to my list here. Now, given being in Vancouver, how did you factor in future buildings going up nearby that might have an effect on you know the original plan for uh, for dealing with shading? Actually, Patrick probably can answer this question pretty well. Patrick, we looked at uh, a lot of. I mean, there are existing buildings that are already around our site and the bridge. I don't think there's much more that can go up. Yeah, yeah, that'd be it. Prudence, we did, um, like when we were in the rezoning stage, for example, the Vancouver house wasn't there, wasn't completed, but we did allow for it in its kind of approved form. Um, but we would say the area is pretty well built out now. Yeah, but that's a good question, Sean, because um, in general, if you're building an urban infill, a lot of times there's already buildings around that are developed, but if, you, if there's a, a lot that's nearby, um, it's pretty important to look at what it's zoned for or what's allowed for in the zoning. And what I typically ask my energy modeling team is to look at the, the extremes, right? So if the site is zoned to allow for you know up to 30 stories or a high rise versus a low rise we look at what that means and try to build in um, a design that will be flexible for either of those scenarios if we just don't know if nothing is permitted yet well i'm uh unofficially giving you guys your plaque so congrats <laughs> you guys you guys deserve it thanks um That's very sweet I, what I thought was interesting too is that the vestibule in the front door is not connected to the thermal envelope. And is that typically because we can't get good security doors that are passive us rated or what was the, the, you know, kind of the issue on that first door being stuck out the thermal envelope? Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, I, I should have had an answer ready for this, Sean. Um, I'm rethinking through the project history. I think in, in previous designs there was a large glass vestibule there like larger than what we see now and then there's um yeah the allowance for the vestibule to be um fully glazed was important you know because it's a uh, public entry to an artist building um but i don't know if it was a strategic decision to um to keep it outside the envelope or if it was um kind of that um you know, the, the, like you said, the security door is one thing. There's automatic door operators. They may be open at some stages for open public houses uh, type of events that are happening in the gallery public space. So that'd be the main reason that the doors may be left open. Yeah, from a passive house perspective, vestibules can be pretty useful um, in terms of allowing whatever that exterior door or glazing is to be flexible um, because airtight, high performance, passive house windows and doors are pretty expensive. Um, and then the other thing is that um, sometimes when it comes to uh, needing panic hardware or something for egress or handicap thresholds, et cetera, those things cannot be airtight, right? They, it just doesn't exist yet that we have airtight versions of those. So if we provide sort of a chamber where we've got double doors, 
it allows us to have more air tightness. Um, essentially, it's belt and suspenders approach. Yeah, I only ask because again, every I think the last two years, every multifamily building has that as like the wish list for for uh, for items that they want. And so the fact that you just took it out, I thought was pretty brilliant. So again, I'm sure in these discussions. You guys have figured out some of those things. Okay, I am only gonna ask one more question and then we can turn it over to kind of a more of a, a social. Um, and I, it's more, I guess, maybe on the cost. Like it's really interesting that you got rid of glazing and and gained more envelope um, kind of in, in the passive house method that you know pr proved that uh, you know, analysis to make worthwhile. Did that have a huge effect then on the cost of the envelope? You know, it's interesting. I don't think we actually ran a cost analysis between the original percentage of glazing and what we ended up with, but that that would that would be nice to do retroactively because I'm sure there's quite a big difference. Um, the The windows, as I mentioned, they're they're pretty expensive to get these high quality passive house windows, and in general, reducing the percentage of of glazing to wall ratio um, does provide cost savings. And then additionally, we're able to reduce the envelope costs by spacing out the clips, by reducing the insulation. Um, we haven't really done uh retroactive cost studies like that yet but you're giving us yeah. ideas <laughs> well again i don't mean to give anybody more work i don't need that for research but it, it's just it's interesting about the whole cost thing when we talk about oh we're you know going from more high performance glazing that's going to cost more but you guys really looked at it from the model saying if we design on comfort and efficiency and energy performance then you know you just get some of these savings and i mean like the nine percent difference between the, the first model and second model is huge. And so hopefully that the, you know, Mark, if he's still there, that he's enjoying the benefits of those cost savings. But hopefully yeah, I, I also think it's important. I mean, you pointed out that we've got the model right up to the edge and I, I actually didn't have the confidence to push it all the way to the limit until everything was worked out, right? I mean, and that's part of why we've gone through every single detail because I really wanted to save Grosvenor money and show the community like we don't have to go to these crazy extremes. We don't need 10 inches of insulation. We don't, you know, we don't need to blow the budget. Passive house doesn't have to be super expensive. Now, there are a lot of sort of like pioneering lessons learned where the soft costs on this project and Mark from Grosvenor can say, yes, absolutely. The soft costs are higher than they would have been because we've been figuring stuff out as a team. Um, and we've got folks who are new to passive house you know we don't we don't have it all figured out so uh those costs have been higher but i think that the construction costs we we really have done a good job at optimizing everything right to the limit of what will comply so that we can get those costs down annie had a quick question here annie do you want to unmute yourself Yes, yeah, I just wanted to know if it was the client's first passive house, uh, passive house project, sorry. Uh, yes, it is, Annie. So, Grosvenor has done a retrofit project in London of, um, I think it's three townhomes. But for new construction, this is uh, Grosvenor's first passive house project globally. So, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of eyes, a lot of attention on it. Um, the interesting thing about this project as well, which, which hasn't come up, on the webinar this evening is that we were also one of the winners of the net zero energy ready challenge and as part of that there's a 18 month uh, post occupancy sort of requirement to to extract data from from metering so we will be able to get some pretty good data out of this building post construction and occupancy to, to to measure how it's actually performing so it's not just a theoretical exercise um, we will actually be able to point to the performance of the building. Was there any major shockers or was it? Yeah. Um, I mean, cost, cost for sure is, is you know, something that it's, it's definitely cost a lot more than we expected. Um, but as Prudence kind of touched on, you know, a little bit of that is sort of paying to learn. Um, for most, you know, consultants, trades, uh, 
it's the first time we're going through this. So the reality is, I think in the beginning, it, it is going to cost it a bit more. But, you know, the size of this project has, has enabled us to, if you see those 10, 20% cost increases, at least it's not going to sort of um, be too detrimental. So. So will you do it again? I mean, I think we will for sure. You know, like I touched on, Grosvenor has, has made a corporate commitment to to have net zero uh, operational carbon by 2030 and net zero embodied carbon by 2050. So I don't see how else we would get there. You know, the, the step codes are also, um, you know, once you get to step four, step five, you're, you're also up there. But um, I think this is the future. I think any... You know, when you look at the city of Vancouver now and you go through rezoning, so there's some very, very lofty sustainability uh, requirements. So, you know, everyone's got to get their head around it. And the only way to do that is by actually starting to do it. Well, on that part two, Mark, thank you and, and the rest of your team for um, paying for uh, uh, the dumb tax, as Cord Cook calls it. He's a guy out of Ontario. And so we, we appreciate you paying the premium for setting yourselves off to uh, hopefully more excellent buildings. Um, and, uh, and again, just fantastic. So we've got four minutes left. Um, I think we probably could just probably wrap it up at this point, unless there's any other questions. I just want to thank everyone, all the speakers, an amazing team. I, I mean, I kind of call you like the, uh, we got to figure like a, like a, all-star team for your, for the name, for all of you coming together to put your brains together to think through this. I think the level of detail and the thought process, hopefully, I mean, LedCorp will, will see it in the schedule and the budget of, of not a lot of change orders because of the details have been, you know, really figured out. And um, from all the pacifist projects that I've seen, I, I think you guys are just, you know, really doing a good job on the planning and, you know, diving into the details. So just bravo to all of you. And thanks for uh, presenting tonight on your inputs and, um, it's, an amazing presentation and kind of lucky that we we first started your the presentation of you guys with the uh, Zebex decarb lunch and and again even the level of detail that you provided tonight is is completely different than I even learned from there so thank you guys everyone so much for uh, for your time and your efforts thanks so much Sean and thanks to everyone and and definitely reach out if you have further questions um, and then Sean um, is this going to be posted or Chris, is the recording of this going to be posted somewhere where people can access it? Yep. I've uh, recorded this session and I will be uh, definitely putting it out to the project team. And then also um, most likely I'm trying to work towards getting it on a YouTube. So the Passos Canada YouTube channel. Fantastic. Uh, all the attendees will get a follow-up link uh, with the survey that is really appreciated if you fill, this, fill out the survey. Um, and then um, I also took a screenshot of all the participants for AIBC credits um, that will be given. So uh, there'll be a little bit of follow up afterwards. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great night. Yeah. Just remember the, uh, the dates that Chris mentioned for future events. So again, we can keep our local group connected um, as we start to, uh, you know, open up the doors and hopefully get to see each other in face. Like, again, you look good on the screen, but um, looking forward to seeing you in the future. And, I'll, and again, I'll shower next time I see you. Bye, guys. Have a good <laughs> Thank night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.